Well, yeah, that completes the simple form of the conservation equations. Let us uh, see how we can use it for a simple integral analysis. Uh, uh, some of this was discussed yesterday, but uh, let us go over it one more time. Okay. We will look at premix flames first. Okay. This uh, is the flame that we used for discussion of equilibrium yesterday. I have added one more picture. Let me explain what the other picture is all about. Okay. So, commonly when uh, you set up uh, or when you ignite a Bunsen burner in a laboratory, a conical flame, flame is formed of this type, excuse me. Uh, now, imagine a special type of Bunsen burner where the incoming mixture velocity can be controlled. You do not have in a usual one that is available in the lab, you do not have that control, but let us say you have built one sp uh, a special one in which you can control the incoming velocities. In such a burner, Starting from a mixture flow rate corresponding to a conical flame that is the flame here, if the mixture flow rate is gradually reduced, the flame will start to flatten out. Okay. So, you start from this condition, you keep reducing the mixture velocity, the flame will slowly become a flat flame. Okay. So, at a particular flow rate, a close to perfect flat flame is formed at a short distance away from the burner like the one that I have shown on the left. Okay. Now, if you continue to reduce the flow rate, if the flow rate is reduced beyond this point, the flame gets attached to a brass disc that is at the inlet. If there is no brass disc at the inlet, the flame will flash back. Okay. What has happened is that in the conical flame, the incoming mixture velocity is higher than the flame speed. Okay. Therefore, a conical flame was formed in such a fashion that the mixture velocity normal to the flame is equal to the flame velocity that is what that is the reason why you have a conical flame here and when you start when we had started reducing the incoming mixture velocity there comes a point where the incoming stream velocity is perfectly matched by the flat flame uh, perfectly matched by the laminar flame speed and therefore you have a flat flame if you reduce it any further the flame will start moving into the unburnt mixture and that is what we call as flashback and in the reverse direction starting from here where you have a conical flame, you keep increasing the velocity of the incoming mixture. What would happen is that the angle of the cone, the flame will become longer, the angle of the cone will become smaller because now the, the angle that is required to make sure that the component of the velocity is matched by the flame velocity is smaller and smaller and there will come a point where the flame cannot actually hold on to the burner anymore because incoming stream velocity is so high that there is no point anchoring point available for it so that it can match the flame velocity it will simply blow off. Okay. So, this is the phenomena of steady flame, flat flame, a steady flat flame, a steady conical flame flashback and blow off. Okay. It is simply determined by the local relationship between the flame speed and the mixture velocity. So, at the point where there is a close to perfect flat flame like the one that is shown on the left at a short distance away from the burner, the in incoming mixture velocity is exactly balanced by the speed of propagation of the flame or the laminar flame speed into the fresh incoming mixture. Okay. And this kind of an arrangement has the following advantage that, that the flame is not strained. We saw yesterday that straining the flame or imposing gradients along the flame can change the structure of the flame. This flame is unstrained because it is a flat flame with velocity normal to it. There are no gradients of velocity along the uh, flame. Okay. So, this flame speed which is for a flat which is that is one dimensional unstrained flame is a characteristic property of the fuel air mixture, the fuel oxidizer mixture. It is not dependent on the flow at all. It is a characteristic property of the mixture and is called the laminar flame speed. Okay. Uh, this also means that uh, the uh, that I have a flat flame, there is fresh mixture approaching the flat flame at exactly the flame speed. I can also do the following, I can create a mixture which is stationary and if I ignite, put an ignition source in it, what I will see is that a flat laminar flame propagates into the unburnt mixture at exactly the flame speed. It is these two scenarios are just uh, a change in the coordinate system. So, if you see it from the perspective, if you have a coordinate frame fixed to the flame, then the flame is stationary and you have mixture approaching the flame at the flame speed. The other situation is when you have the 
uh, coordinate frame fixed with respect to the unburnt mixture then you have a flat flame uh, propagating at the flame speed going into the mixture ok. I will show you a video of uh, uh, that arrangement in a moment ok. So, this is the arrangement where the unburnt gases are stationary and the flame propagates through it. So, this is a tube in which uh, this is a tube in which the unburnt mixture is filled it is ignited at the top and you see a video of uh, lean and close to stoichiometric and a rich mixture a flame propagating in these three mixtures this will show you uh, the same in slow motion of course there are uh, uh, there are there is formation of boundary layer and other aspects which uh, distort the flame this is for lpg yeah let me play it one more time yeah This is a nice close to flat flame. This is a stoichiometric flame which is nearly flat. Under rich conditions, there are several instabilities that uh, make the flame distorted. Let me not go into the details. Maybe I will pause here. This is a good frame to look at uh, all the three flames. So, this at this moment, the lean flame is more or less flat. This has gone from being flat to spread out a little bit because of the uh, velocity gradients in the tube and the rich flame which is a weak flame uh, is propagating slower of course. The other point that I wanted to make is that this is a bright and strong flame close to stoichiometry with a flame speed uh, that is the maximum of the three cases. The lean and the rich cases both propagate at a velocity that is lower than the stoichiometric speed and the flames also look visually weak. The heat release in these flames is uh, are much lower than what it is in stoichiometric conditions ok. These are broad features of uh, laminar premix flames ok. So, we say that this is more reactive than the other two cases and that is what we want to formally express using uh, simplified conservation equations. Ok, let me go back to I have shown you the video of the flame tube experiment this we saw yesterday. So, you can start from the steady one dimensional energy equation and if you integrate it from uh, negative infinite to uh, positive infinite uh, the gradients in these two extremes are 0. So, all the uh, gradients with respect to x or derivatives with respect to x will drop out you will be left with only uh, two terms one is the heat release because of chemical reaction which we just saw is omega dot delta h c ok. Uh, for a one step irreversible reaction. This is the heat that is released in the flame zone where the temperature increases because of the chemical reaction. Remember that for a steady flame the heat that is released in the reaction zone ok the same rate at which the rate at which it is released in the reaction zone at the same rate re heat must be removed out of the reaction zone. If not the temperature in the reaction zone will continuously increase you see the point yeah. So, for a steady temperature profile the rate of heat generation must be matched by the rate of removal of heat from the reaction zone. So, all the heat that is released is used to raise the temperature of the incoming mixture from initial temperature to the adiabatic flame temperature and the heat must be removed out of the reaction zone at the same rate because of conduction. You have high temperature here, low temperature here, there is a gradient in temperature. So, heat transfer will happen from the high temperature zone to the low temperature zone. So, and this rate of heat removal must be equal to the rate of heat release because of combustion otherwise the temperature profile will not be steady ok. And now this combined with the fact that the incoming mixture must be consumed in the reaction zone because we know that the state to the right of the flame is close to equilibrium state therefore, the net chemical reaction rates are 0 here. So, all the reactions happen in this zone and the reaction rate is such that all the reactants are consumed ok. If it is stoichiometric both fuel and oxidizer are consumed, if it is lean all the fuel is consumed, if it is rich all the oxidizer is consumed. So, the uh, the smallest quantity whichever is in smaller deficient reactant will be consumed completely. 
So, now you can combine these equations okay, and you can show see you have two equations and uh, you have two variables one is the flame speed the other is the thickness of the flame. Okay. Now, you can combine these two equations to get a relationship uh, between the flame speed and the reaction rate the thickness and the reaction rate. Okay. This is this is exactly what was introduced yesterday the flame speed goes as the square root of the overall reaction rate okay. it goes as square root k by C p square root uh, omega dot and the thickness of the flame goes as 1 by square root of omega dot. Okay. From here you can also show the other thing that uh, S u delta by alpha which is the flame Reynolds number is 1. Okay. You can just multiply these two and divide by alpha you can show that it is equal to 1. So, the uh, point that I want to emphasize again is that the flame speed is a measure of reactivity of the mixture. So, higher the flame speed higher is the reactivity the higher is the reactivity thinner is the flame. Okay. So, now uh, recall that we use these relations earlier to estimate the typical flame thickness of premixed flames by eliminating the reaction rate term. You can do that and show that delta is alpha by S u this also means that S u delta by alpha is 1 that is the flame Reynolds number is 1 and can eliminate delta from these two equations you will get omega dot equals rho u S u the whole squared C p by k. Remember that this is the form for the reaction rate that we used used yesterday to get an estimate for delta. Okay. This is also the equation that I used to emphasize that it is much it is easier to measure flame speed than reaction rate. In fact, the question of what it means to measure reaction rate itself was discussed uh, earlier, but it is much easier to measure flame speed which is a which has a direct relationship to the reaction rate and the reactivity or the relative reactivity of mixtures can be estimated simply from this relationship and this relationship follows from a simple energy and mass balance for the flame zone. Okay. Notice that the flame speed as well as the flame thickness are dependent strongly on reaction rates this is a reaction control phenomena. Thermophysical and transport properties also play a role it is not that diffusion is absent, but there is a reaction diffusion balance and reaction uh, effects are significant and uh, the effect of flame speed or uh, thermophysical and transport properties on flame speed are more evident in cases where there is large disparity in the transport properties. For example, if you have hydrogen which diffuses much faster than the oxidizer and other fuels like methane and uh, LPG you will see significant effects of transport properties okay. that is what is reflected here in terms of heat release as a function of non dimensional temperature between a typical hydrocarbon air uh, case and hydrogen oxygen case. Another important thing to note uh, which I already mentioned is that it is easier to experimentally measure flame speed compared to reaction rates. Okay. The usefulness of this fact will become clear when we discuss composite solid propellants. A uh, quick uh, uh, discussion on the dependence of flame speed and thickness on pressure. Okay. Uh, we know that uh, we will use this expression for flame speed S u goes as 1 over rho u square root k by C p and square root omega dot bar and the density is directly proportional to pressure k by C p is relatively insensitive to pressure. And the reaction rate has the following dependence on pressure uh, it is it comes through the uh, dependence of concentration on pressure uh, it is the concentration of the fuel uh, rise to some exponent concentration of oxidizer rise to some exponent. This is the Arrhenius term which we saw yesterday exponential minus Ea by Rt therefore, omega dot has of course, a very strong dependence on temperature it has an exponential dependence on temperature which uh, we already know and the pressure dependence come through the concentration dependence on pressure which will become pressure rise to m plus n. Okay. In typical conditions of pressure and temperature uh, binary collisions dominate and therefore, uh, m plus n is equal to 2. Okay. So, if you plug this into the expression for flame speed we can see that the flame speed is in general is insensitive to pressure and the flame thickness varies inversely as pressure flame speed goes as p rise to close to 0 and the thickness goes as 1 uh, over pressure rise to n by 2. Okay. 
but I want to emphasize that there are important exceptions to this. Flame speed of methane air mixture is sensitive to pressure because different reaction pathways are dominant at different pressures and therefore m plus n is not the effective m plus n is not always 2. The flame speed actually decreases significantly with increase in pressure. This is due to different reaction pathways controlling the overall reactivity under different pressures. So, the takeaway is the general conclusion is that the flame speed is insensitive to pressure, there are exceptions and the flame thickness will decrease with increase in pressure. Okay. That uh, completes the discussion on premix flames. If there are any questions, uh, now is the right time on premix flames. Okay. If there are no questions, let us move on to non premix flames. So, Unlike premix flames, in non premix flames, the rate controlling step could be any of the following. In premix flames, remember that the reaction rate is the rate controlling uh, feature. In non premix flames, it could be any of the following or a combination of these. Time of mixing of fuel and oxidizer in the case of gaseous fuels and oxidizer. Remember that the fuel and the oxidizer must mix before the reaction can happen, and the time for mixing can be much. Uh, larger than the time it takes for the reactions to happen. Therefore, mixing can be rate limiting. In the example that we saw earlier of ethanol droplet burning, time of evaporation is uh, rate limiting okay. and in under some extreme conditions, it is possible that the mixing times are made much smaller. I will give you one example of where this happens. The time for chemical reaction can also become rate limiting. Okay. So, in premix flames, the behavior is more or less universal, uh, the dynamics is controlled by reaction rate under all conditions, but in non premix flames it can be any of these 3. Okay. So, each one of these uh, phenomena is a function of the following variables. The length scale of fuel oxidizer supply which could be for example, one, one of the examples that I showed was conversion of uh, matrix of AP and HTPB. It could be the diameter of the injector issuing fuel or oxidizer, the droplet diameter or the AP ammonium perchlorate particle size and other variables include pressure and temperature. I will demonstrate what I mean by this statement with a simple example. Okay. This all everything that I mentioned in the previous slide is best illustrated with the example of a non premix flame formed by a gaseous fuel issuing out of a tube. Uh, this is a similar arrangement to the premix flame uh, that we saw earlier except that there we had a stoichiometric close to stoichiometric mixture of methane and air coming out of the tube. Here what we have is pure ethylene coming out of the tube. Okay. There is only fuel coming out of the tube. It burns by taking oxidizer from the surroundings. So, in the photograph that is shown below, ethylene is issuing out of a 5 millimeter diameter tube okay, and forming a non premixed or in this case a diffusion a pure diffusion flame. One for the first question that we could ask is what determines the height of this type of flame. Uh, this can be uh, the functional, the, the principal dependence of this can be extracted from a simple analysis. So, starting with the assumption that the rate controlling mechanism is mixing of fuel and oxidizer, which in this case is the quiescent air, quiescent air in the ambient. The time taken by the fuel to go from the outlet of the tube to the tip of the flame should be equal to the time it would take oxygen in the air to diffuse to the center. Let me explain what I mean by that. See the fuel comes out of the tube here and almost all the fuel is consumed at this point, right. All the fuel is consumed at this point. That means the oxygen that is required, stoichiometric amount of oxygen that is required to burn off all this fuel must have entered a volume that is enclosing this flame within this height. Remember that diffusion flame it is always stoichiometric, wherever reaction happens it is always stoichiometric. So, for all the fuel to be consumed, yes. Yes. But uh, coming to the real flame where the heat release is actually happening, yeah. that flame may be, may not be exactly what we have been discussing like the end of that. The length may be even smaller. The length may be even smaller is the comment that you are making. Uh, Maybe this is the visual spectrum that we are seeing. That is, uh, we, we go for combustion diagnosis, OH map, 
then the length may be a bit shorter where we can exactly match the match the plane. it is possible that the flame length in this case is probably uh, somewhere here okay there is another phenomena that is happening which i have not mentioned there is also some smoke that is going out yeah soot that is going out but uh, for the purposes of the discussion we can assume that the bright yellow cone where it terminates is where the flame uh, stops okay what you see downstream of that is probably some hot uh, carbon particles that are leaving and emitting some radiation okay uh, even with that the all the oxidizer that is required for consuming the fuel must enter the volume surrounding the flame within that height okay so the time that is available for the fuel to go from the tip uh, from the uh, inlet to the tip okay is the height of the flame divided by the velocity of the fuel and within that time oxidizer should go from the periphery to the center of the flame okay, by diffusion remember that the diffusion time scale and length scale are related by delta goes to square root alpha uh, square root uh, dtr or alpha tr which we saw earlier so uh, maybe i'll just do the algebra here what i'm trying to say is that you have a jet uh, issuing issuing ethylene the fuel is coming out of a jet and forming a flame a non premixed flame which has a height of h so the height of h the point that i am making is the time let us say the fuel is entering with the velocity of v f the a good measure of the time it takes for the fuel to go from the inlet to the tip okay the time it takes for the fuel to go from inlet to the tip, tip is the height divided by the velocity this is a good measure of the time within this time the oxidizer should go from here to here the oxidizer must diffuse from here to here which is a distance of d by 2 okay unless this happens the flame will not terminate here there will be extra fuel left which has to get more oxidizer or the if uh, this had happened a little earlier there will be more oxygen than what is required for burning off all the fuel so the flame would have terminated little earlier okay so this is the limiting condition remember that the diffusion length and time scale are connected by this kind of an expression for thermal diffusion for mass diffusion the thermal diffusion coefficient is replaced by the mass diffusion coefficient so delta goes as mass diffusivity multiplied by time if we assume that the lewis number is 1 alpha is equal to d let's not worry about that so delta goes as square root dt therefore time goes as delta squared which is a diffusion length scale divided by the diffusion coefficient here the diffusion length scale is the distance that oxidizer must diffuse is d by 2 therefore this time will go as d by 2 squared over the diffusion coefficient so this time the time it takes for the fuel to go from the inlet to the tip should be matched by the time it takes for the oxidizer to go from the edge of the burner to the center so this is what controls the height of the flame okay so h by the velocity of the fuel goes as d by 2 squared by d okay you can now uh, rearrange this uh, this implies that h uh, goes as d squared by 4 times d multiplied by the velocity of the fuel okay from here you can show that h divided by d the length or the height of the flame measured in terms of the diameter of the burner goes as vf multiplied by d which is the diameter divided by 4 times the diffusion coefficient. Let us assume that Lewis number which is alpha by d is 1. Let us also assume that Prandtl number which is nu by alpha is approximately 1. Therefore, alpha is equal to d is equal to nu. So, this is nothing but Vf d by 4 times nu and you can recognize that this is nothing but Reynolds number. 
the Reynolds number of the jet that is issuing from the uh, inlet. Okay. So, the non-dimensional height or the height of the flame measured in as multiples of diameter of the burner is proportional to the Reynolds number of the uh, jet that is issuing out of it. Of course, you, these assumptions are not uh, restrictive. You can assume that Prandtl number is not 1, you will get an extra term okay, here in either in terms of Prandtl number or Schmidt number. Okay. Okay, this is what is summarized here in the last uh, line. So, the time for the fuel to go is h by Vf, this is the diffusion time which implies that the non-dimensional height goes as Reynolds number or Reynolds number divided by 4, I am leaving out the factor of 4 there. Okay. This is also, this is not, uh, this is a case where uh, a simple analysis of this type reveals some interesting dynamics. In fact, the experimental results show indeed that when you plot h by d as a function of Reynolds number, the following thing happens as long as you are in the laminar regime as expected from the scaling analysis the h by d increases linearly with Reynolds number till some point okay. and the Reynolds number crosses a certain threshold you see effects of turbulence. Okay. So, what happens is that the base of the flame remains laminar the tip starts becoming turbulent and as you increase the Reynolds number the height remains more or less the same in fact it comes down a little bit and then remains constant. But what changes as you increase Reynolds number beyond this point is more and more of the flame will become turbulent. Okay. Here look at this case, here all the flame is laminar, when you went here the tip became turbulent and the rest of the flame was laminar. As you increase the Reynolds number, the fraction of the height of the flame that will be turbulent will increase. Okay. In fact, this is a simple demonstration of the fact that turbulence increases the consumption rate of the fuel. Okay. The height remains constant as you increase Reynolds number you are increasing the amount of fuel that is going to the flame okay. and therefore within the same volume look at this case and this case Reynolds number on the right is larger than the Reynolds number on the left you are issuing more fuel and the extra fuel is consumed within the same reaction volume and therefore, the reaction rate or the consumption rate of the fuel is enhanced by turbulence, okay. not by reaction rate simply because of enhanced mixing because of uh, turbulence. Okay. So, at some point you will see that the entire flame would have become turbulent if you increase the Reynolds number beyond that point the flame lifts off okay. and if you increase it further it blows off because once it lifts off. Okay, it is lifting off because it is not able to anchor to the burner because locally the transport rate of the fuel, the rate of transport of fuel to the flame is not matched by the reaction rate and if you increase it any further it blows off because you are issuing fuel at a rate that is more than what the flame can consume it brings down the temperature and blows off the flame. Okay. So, of course, in the laminar regime this linear relationship is, uh, is accurate. Okay. So, that is uh, an example of, uh, of a diffusion, a non-premix flame which was an ideal diffusion flame where the height of the flame was simply controlled only by the diffusion phenomena and the reaction rates are much faster. Okay. The question I am posing is how do we know that mixing is a rate limiting step? Of course, for that case we know because we assumed that mixing is a rate limiting step, we derived a conclusion that h by d should linearly vary with Reynolds number if that is the case and the experimental results indeed show that h by d goes as Reynolds number in the laminar regime. So, there in that case we know that mixing is a rate limiting step, but we can pose a general question, can we come up with a way of uh, finding out for a given condition is the flame going to be controlled only by mixing or will other chemical reaction effects come into picture. So, I am posing the general question here and to answer this question we go back to the same idea that we have been using so far. We need to estimate the lateral distance the fuel and oxidizer can travel by diffusion before the mixture can start reacting. Okay. What I am trying to convey here is that you are issuing fuel from here, the oxidizer is diffusing from outside and let us say you just send fuel and do not ignite what will happen is that the fuel and oxidizer will mix, will diffuse into each other and mix and when you ignite a diffusion flame is formed. 
the question that I am posing is that is the reaction rate always much much higher than the diffusion rate. Okay. The way to determine that is by estimating how much the fuel can diffuse out or the oxidizer can diffuse in. You have a jet that is coming out, the fuel will diffuse out because the concentration of the fuel is high at the center and low at the periphery. The oxidizer will diffuse in because the concentration of oxidizer is high at the outside and low in the inside. Okay. So, the question that uh, we are posing is how much distance the fuel can move out and the oxidizer can move in before a flame gets established. Because once a flame get, gets established and the reaction rate in the flame is significantly higher than the mixing rate, all the fuel that comes to the flame will be consumed, all the, I am sorry, all the fuel that came st uh, comes to the uh, flame will be consumed and all the oxidizer that comes to the flame will be consumed because diffusion flames stabilize or diffusion flames establish itself at stoichiometric value. Okay. So, the question is how much lateral distance the fuel and oxidizer can travel by diffusion before the mixture can start reacting. This would be same as square root dTr or square root alpha Tr. Okay. That is the distance that the fuel and the oxidizer can move laterally before they start burning. Okay. Because it takes Tr seconds for them to react okay. and once reaction starts there is no further movement of the fuel because the fuel is all consumed, the oxidizer is all consumed. So, the time that is available for it to move laterally and mix is only the time it takes for the reaction to happen. Okay. This is the same estimate, that yes. Alpha is the thermal diffusion. yes of course, I am making a simplification that uh, the Lewis number is 1. So, all the transport coefficients are. We have been talking about the diffusion of two species in different directions. It should be, it should technically, be. it should be dTr. Of course, I am assuming for simplicity that the Lewis number is 1. Therefore, all the transport coefficients, mass, heat, yeah, and momentum, thermal coefficient. they are all equal. Yeah. So, this is the same relation which we used earlier to estimate the thickness of a premix flame. Therefore, the distance of fuel and oxidizer can diffuse laterally before starting to react is of the same order as the thickness of a premix flame. Okay, because Tr again will be calculated from the reaction rate of the premix flame and therefore, this estimate will be same as the thickness that we calculated as uh, calculated earlier uh, when uh, doing thermodynamic equilibrium calculations which we saw is between 5 and 250 microns at 1 atmosphere. Okay. So, the point is that in this case also there is a certain amount of there is a certain thickness over which the fuel and oxidizer are in mixed state. Only that that distance is somewhere between 5 and 250 micron okay, or 0 0.05 to 0.25 micron uh, 0.25 millimeters and that distance compared to the 5 millimeters of the burner is much smaller okay. and that is the reason it is correct to assume that the reaction zone thickness is very small the thin flame approximation is valid because the distance over which the fuel and oxidizer can coexist is as small as 5 microns or a maximum of 250 microns and that compared to 5 millimeters is very small. But remember that this distance will decrease with increase in pressure because the reaction rates will increase with increase in pressure and therefore, the time for reaction will decrease with increase in pressure and therefore, the delta will decrease with pressure. And also because as the flame thickness is inversely uh, goes as pressure, uh, pressure, so the thickness of the flame will come down with pressure. This also means that instead of increasing the pressure, I can decrease the pressure. So, if we start with a diffusion flame and if the pressure is reduced to sufficiently low level, okay, the thickness, the diffusion layer thickness can become comparable to the diameter of the burner. So, the point that I am making is you can start with the same 5 mm ethylene, uh, 5 mm tube issuing ethylene. Instead of 1 atmosphere, you keep decreasing the pressure. You can go, if you go to sufficiently low pressure, the same diffusion flame can actually become a premix flame. Okay. Simply because the mixing times are approximately the same as you change the pressure, but you are reducing the reaction rate and reducing the reaction time by reducing pressure. So, I will summarize that in this point. This also means that if the pressure is reduced to sufficiently low level, 
the thickness can become comparable to the diameter of the burner and the non premixed flame can become a premixed flame okay uh, we'll just uh, just so we don't uh, delta goes as square root dtr remember the tr we saw in the earlier lecture is rho divided by omega dot okay and omega dot goes as pressure squared exponential minus e by rt okay multiplied by a pre exponential factor okay so the delta will go as d instead of tr i'll substitute a p squared i'm sorry uh, tr is square root d square root of rho divided by omega dot this goes to square root d square root rho divided by square root of the reaction rate which is a p squared exponential minus e by rt square okay so d goes as square root rho d by p okay with some factors which i have not written there rho d is insensitive to pressure okay so the thickness as you decrease pressure as you increase pressure thickness will decrease pressure increases delta will decrease this we already know from the premix flame analysis the thickness of the premix flame will decrease with increase in pressure but it also means that the delta will increase as the pressure decreases so if i decrease pressure to a level where delta becomes let's say 3 mm or 2 and a half 3 mm that means the fuel in a 5 mm tube if delta comes to 2 and a half mm the fuel and oxidizer can move laterally by 2 and a half mm which covers the entire diameter of the tube so the entire mixture will become premixed before the reaction begins and that means you will have a premixed flame in fact this would be a very nice experiment to do and take pictures of yeah so the increase of this temperature comes as an exponential term here yeah yeah and the moment we increase the ambient temperature to very high level correct also so, we have the same effect yes uh, if you increase the ambient temperature the reaction rates will increase so the thickness will decrease so you have to reduce the temperature to have the effect but it is not as uh, significant as a pressure effect because if you decrease the temperature a whole lot it may not even ignite <coughs> the same expression varies i assume that the boundary conditions of the governing equations of the same okay i am having the droplet traveling in a combustor mm -hmm. and uh, the same conditions like the diffusion portions and the thermal diffusion uh, rates are almost like similar to the same number is valid for even for a droplet diffusion uh you need to look at the vaporization time also so here there are only two time scales one is a time for mixing and a time for the reaction when you have a droplet it is uh, it will be likely that the evaporation is much uh, slower than any of the other phenomena it may still remain rate controlling mixing and uh, chemical reactions will be much faster than the vaporization process so this is one way that a diffusion a purely diffusion flame can become premixed there is also another way which the same Uh, equation suggests i fix the diameter reduce the pressure to increase the diffusion length but i can also do the other thing i can cause premixing another way to cause premixing is when the diameter of the tube is reduced to a to a thickness comparable to that of the flame thickness okay remember that the delta at one atmosphere is can it can be anywhere between 5 microns and 250 microns now if i keep reducing the diameter of the tube where the size of the tube becomes 250 microns then there will be significant premixing you may think that this is unrealistic but we saw an example of ap htpb combustion where there is an ap particle which is issuing a jet of oxidizer and the size of the ap particle can be 200 microns in fact the typical ap sizes that are used in composite solid propellant making can vary from as small as 1 micron to as large as about 500 micron so in a in a in a given propellant you may have zones where 
you have AP particles as small as a few microns ok and we may be tempted to assume that because it is giving out oxidizer surrounded by fuel that the dynamics is controlled by non premixed diffusion flames, but it may not be the case because the diffusion distances are comparable to the size of the AP particle that is issuing the oxidizer <coughs> significant premixing can happen because of lateral diffusion before the flame ignites. So, they, the effects of premixing cannot be ignored. In fact, the classical thinking of multiple flames that form between uh, AP surrounded by binder is that you have an AP monopropellant flame surrounded by what is called a primary diffusion flame, but it may not be the correct description because the possibility of significant premixing exists. The right terminology is probably to only call it as a primary flame and not a primary diffusion flame. It can be a primary diffusion flame under some cir circumstances or some conditions of particle size and pressure. At some other conditions of particle size and pressure, it could be a primary premix flame also. So, the takeaway is that premix flame behavior is governed by same conditions under all conditions of pressure, reaction rate controls everything is already thoroughly mixed. So, there is no question of mixing time everything is controlled by reaction time. It is not the case for non premixed flames because there are variety of phenomena at uh, play and the two important phenomena are one is the time for mixing and the other is the time for reaction. And in cases where there are droplets the time for evaporation is also a significant factor or will be the rate limiting step. So, the behavior of non premix flames is a strong function of dimensions of fuel and oxidizer supply source. When I say that uh, I would like you to imagine a 10 micron diameter AP particle issuing oxidizer ok. These are uh, you know uh, as real as it gets it is not that 10 micron fuel sources are not there it is there in sitting inside composite solid propellants. Therefore, the behavior will be close to that of an ideal diffusion flame. What I mean by an ideal I am referring to the ethylene flame the picture of which I showed you where the assumption of infinitely fast reactions and hence independent the dynamics being ind independent of pressure is valid because the dimension of the fuel issuing tube is much larger than the lateral diffusion distance ok. But the dynamics or the behavior will become close to a premixed flame when the size of the fuel issuing tube becomes comparable to the lateral diffusion distance and hence a strong function of pressure. Remember that now the extent of diffusion is dependent on square root alpha T r which goes as 1 by pressure and therefore, a non premixed situation the behavior burning behavior becomes sensitive to pressure ok. So, it is also Okay. It is also possible to change the structure of the non premixed flame without changing the pressure or dimensions. I ok let me just quickly no uh, I think this is going to take some time I think this is the right time to take a break. So, I will stop with this these two points I think these two points are the important takeaway. D much much greater than square root alpha T r dynamics are is controlled by mixing and not by chemical reactions. But when D becomes comparable to square root alpha T r dynamics becomes controlled by reaction rates and hence a strong function of pressure.